Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode eight, our second episode this month. Yeah, which is uh, pretty good for us. It is、uh, I hope we're not getting your expectations up because reading break does not happen twelve months out of the year. And we are both very busy people who、uh, just like burning the candle at both ends to be edgy. The candle's supposed to burn from both just... ends. It's when you start lighting it in the middle. It's when you cut the candle in half to give yourself an extra two ends that you run into problems. We also like just tunneling through the candles. We don't like to use any of the sides to like save any like extra bits of the candle. Yeah, it's good for wax melts. Gotta say, really good for that. Waste the candle though. The candle of our souls. This metaphor got stretched <laughs> way too far. I like stretching a metaphor. Anyways, this is gonna be our somewhat Valentine's Day episode. Yeah. So if you've listened to the most recent episode that's gonna come out before this, we had a guest who we were very excited to have, but we weren't really sure how it was going to work、uh, and if it was even gonna come to fruition. Not anything on the guest we had. Just yeah. Us and schedules and things get weird this time of year. So I pitched to Victoria that to keep us from having to plan like two very full, cohesive episodes, but to still have a backup in case it didn't work out with our guest, we would do a blind study date. Which is Vic and I have both picked a topic that we're going to spend about a half an episode on. This may end up being a long episode. And we're surprising each other with it, so I have no idea what Vic has chosen for her topic. Vic has no idea what I've chosen. And then at the end of this episode, we also are going to do a little bit of Q and A. Victoria, do you want to explain how that? Yes.、Works? So I run our social media. So if you come into talk- contact with us on like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. That's me you're talking to, and basically I put up a poll. Sorry, not a poll. A, a little question box on our Instagram stories, and people just put in so many amazing questions. I'm really excited about it. We got a lot, Sloane, and it's gonna be. I think this is gonna bring up a lot of fun conversations between us. Yeah. So I mean, obviously the podcast isn't about us. We are hosts, and we deliver. Far more exciting topics, frankly, than I am. Vic, you're pretty exciting, but me.、Oh, I、no. think you're exciting, Sloane. You're my best friend. Like I'm biased, but I think you're exciting. Well, thank you. But yeah, I think that this will be fun. If you know, if listeners are interested, I'm happy to do a few what have yous at the end. So, oh, Vic- c- c- should we do our announcement? No, no, no! At the end,、oh, okay. because I'm glad you mentioned the announcement. Now people will stay until the end. Oh yes, keep them in the suspense. Okay, we're prepped. Got so many tabs open. It's gonna be great. So Sloan has allowed me to go first. Now Sloan, I have told you that in the drive there is a chaotic collage. Yeah, I think I found it. Can I just say? Yeah, I have it open. I'm looking at it again. <laughs> This is not a visual medium. No, it's not a visual medium. But I think it's fun just to have that as like a reference and like Sloane. Do you want to guess what I'm gonna talk about today from those pictures? This is going up on the social media, I presume. Yes, it is. Okay. Just so our, our listeners aren't gonna be confused. Think, but um, so I I know this is gonna be something in the Victorian era. Um. No. Okay. That's probably me misattributing the Victorian era. This is gonna be something in the Regency era. Ah.、Uh, I got nothing. Tell me. Oh, we're gonna talk about Jane Austen. <laughs> yeah, there's a Pride and Prejudice there. That makes sense. And wet T-shirt scene with、uh, Colin Firth in the middle of a lake. Our listeners might not know this, but、uh, I'm a big book fan. Like to the point where I my entire personal Instagram is dedicated to books and to reading. Jane Austen has always been a favorite author of mine. I've like read her novels and watched a lot of the adaptations. Some of which Sloane has watched with me. My favorite being Austenland because it is the best. Yeah, I enjoy watching these films with you because it's not an area of history that I've spent time in. You know, academically, it, it's not something that, by and large, I choose for myself to learn about. So I'm excited to hear a little bit about this and how it's going to relate to, you know, Valentine's and all that stuff. So what? Really got me into this was back in December. There's gonna be a Jane Austen tea party in honor of her birthday. So over the course of three days, I I went crazy and I made an entire costume from scratch. 
It was very stressful. I do not recommend doing that when you are a person with high anxiety. But so I went to it. I paid the $17. It was it was a lot of fun. But there was a trivia quiz. And during that trivia quiz, we answered questions about Jane Austen and her life. Like just so so you probably don't know who Harris Baker Wither is. In the Jane Austen community, he's kind of infamous. And it's because of a certain incident with Jane Austen. So Jane Austen's work has a life and a vivacity that is really powerful. Like the fan base is incredible. Like it is vast and it stretches all across the globe. People make costumes and enjoy it. Like I think we're even starting to see like a a heyday of that right now. Lots of people are joining the Jane Austen community because of Bridgerton, the new TV series that premiered on Netflix. But anyways, so Jane Austen is known as a spinster. Uh, she never married. She was most frequently known to be like in the company of her sister Cassandra. But there are two r male romantic figures that stand out. Now, you see the picture of Jane's McAvoy Sloan. Yes. I I chose the weirdest picture I could go for. I'm pretty sure that's when he's in yes. Narnia. Uh which, you know, we could have a conversation on uh, World War II fiction at yeah. some point. That could be cool. Or sorry, World War I fiction. Uh, no, you're right. Uh, that could be cool. I just yeah. chose that because that was one of the roles that stuck out in my head. It was either that or uh, mm -hmm. the character in Split. I, I decided Mr. Tumnus was a good way to go, you know. Anyways, so he was in this movie where he played uh, Thomas Lefroy. And people, like, I think they... People tend to over-exaggerate this in the Jane Austen community. People say that he is the basis for all the male leads. And I think that is bullshit. Because they have this quite flirtatious relationship. I've got the letters of Jane Austen open on my laptop here. Really, really nice to have this resource. Anyways, from what I read, like, they were flirty, but they weren't serious about one another. Like, people say, oh, well, they couldn't get married because their families didn't have enough money for one another. Like, it probably wouldn't have worked out. People tend to exaggerate their relationship. Like, the movie with James McAvoy does that. Like, even has a scene where James McAvoy as Tom Lefroy and Anne Hathaway as Jane Austen nearly elope with one another. I think Anne Hathaway is an interesting choice, mm -hmm. but we're not going to get into my, my thoughts on that. Anyways, I'm going to read this to you. You scold me so much in the nice long letter which I have this moment received from you, and I'm most afraid to tell you how my Irish friend and I behaved. The Irish friend being Tom Lefroy. Imagine to yourself everything most profligate and shocking in the way of dancing and sitting down together. I can expose myself, however, only once more because he leaves the country soon after next Friday, on which day we are to have a dance at Ash after all. He's very gentlemanlike, good-looking, pleasant young man, I assure you. But as to our having ever met, except that the last three balls, I cannot say much, for he's so excessively laughed at about me at Ash that he is ashamed of coming to Steventon and ran away when we called to Mrs. Lefroy a few days ago. Honestly, I don't... Sloan, what do you think? Do you think that sounds like a, like a person that, that she would see herself marrying? I don't know. I'm not fond of making assumptions about mentality on historical figures and I think that's I imagine that's where you're going with this is that we have this kind of we have a female literary figure or we've got a female historical figure and we're getting overly involved in her sex life or her romantic life I'm getting at yeah like letters are difficult and working with letters is very difficult I've worked with usually legal documents and even those can be a bit hard to figure out the connotations of certain words, um, like tippling, which means when you get drunker than you ought to, uh, by and large. But if you can think of someone who is able to carry themselves into the bar on two legs, and those same two legs will not carry them out after they've been in the bar. Um, I don't know enough about Regency era courtship to have a gauge of what that letter actually sounds like, but I imagine you're going to tell me. From the letters I read, that was just one example. Like, they just don't really seem... They seem to, like, be friendly with one another. They seem to be friends, like, a bit flirty. But, like, she said, she's... They're they're being quite quite naughty. Like, just sitting together and just chatting away. Like, 
as people do. I think people read too much into that. Yeah. But that's just me. Interesting. It seems very emblematic of the idea that men and women can't just be friends. You know, just heteronormativity at its very, very best. Yeah. So Jane's, like, her sort of friend group is mainly, like, like she's friend with uh, Thomas Lefroy's aunt, really close with her sister. Not so much with her brothers, but still they're pretty close to the point, like, she wrote them into her novels, doing uh, sort of caricatures of them as her famous characters, like in Persuasion, her brother. I remember reading in Paula Burns's uh, book, Jane Austen, A Life in Small Things. He connected with a, a character of one of the sailors that character Anne comes across in her visits to Lyme and stuff. It's really, really sweet. They, they seem to really enjoy that. But one of the things is that I think that often scholars tend to treat women who are spinsters or single, if they wrote something, say, that is qu quite romantic and style, but thinking, well, just because they're single means that they can't have an imagination. They tend to act like if they haven't experienced it, then they can't uh, write about it, which I think is just bullshit. Yeah, it's some um, interesting, I think baked into that is the assumption that any main character she writes is supposed to be her or a version of her. Yeah. When you start saying that every leading man, because her books predominantly revolve around female characters, when you start yeah. saying that any leading man has to be based off of the most significant man in her life. Imagination, definitely, but also the idea that she couldn't just know what she wanted or she couldn't just have an opinion of what is good there must have been somebody there setting a good example for her yeah that's interesting yeah. so harris bigwither he is the person that jane austen was engaged to but for one night harris bigwither family friend she wasn't really that close to him but she was i think she was around 28 at the time he proposed and she said yes However, the next morning, she was staying at with his family, with her sister Cassandra, I believe. She basically said she changed her mind and then they left. And it's mainly just because, like, she didn't really see herself marrying someone that she didn't care about. Like, much like her characters in the books. Like, we have the character of Charlotte Lucas in Pride and Prejudice, who is Elizabeth's best friend, who marries Mr. Collins because she's 27 years old. And she's been living with her parents, like, and she feels like a burden, so she marries him. But it's not a great relationship. He's always working out in the garden, and she's always hiding in the parlor because she doesn't want to see him. And that's sort of the relationship that mm -hmm. Austin is trying to avoid here. People tend to focus too much on that, being, like, treating it almost like the Mr. Collins proposal. But it's really just Jane knowing what she wants and knowing that she doesn't want to be her character yeah. And becoming unhappy. From my, what I've read, she was a generally happy person. She loved being with her family. Like, she had doted on her nieces and nephews. Her uh, niece, Fanny, she's been kind of immortalized. Her name has been given to the character of Fanny Price, who is considered to be Jane's favorite character in Mansfield Park. Which, by the way, very fascinating book if you want to talk about the abolition of, of slavery, because uh, Jane was an ardent abolitionist. So, Lord Mansfield around the time that this book was published, there was a big legal case that he did and that led to sort of the abolition of slavery. Mansfield Park is playing off of that and also kind of retelling the story of um, Dido Bell in the process. Yeah, and I think looking at the fiction of an era is a completely valid way to approach it. Uh, it's definitely an interdisciplinary thing when you start looking at literature as a primary source. So I think that I I like that you're kind of pointing out the boundaries between when you can use it as a primary source of an era, but not assuming that it says something specifically about the author. It's very much a death of the author approach, which is certainly something that we borrow from literature. So if I'm getting your message correctly, you're talking about the fact that Jane Austen's books are certainly of the world she's writing in, but not necessarily of her. Well, basically... Everyone treats her books like romance. They treat it like a paperback that you get in a grocery store and you read, and it's, it gets your heart pounding, but it's they don't think that there's anything to it. As a romance writer, and not, well, actually, as a romance writer and a romance reader, I think that is really reductive 
a lot of romance writers actually put in a lot of critiques of the society that they're in. I'm seeing that a lot recently. Like, there's one romance series, and it's, like, bringing down the Duke, and it's talking about the suffragist movement and sort of connecting that. How would the politics of the suffragettes movement play into romance? Stuff like that. Politics and stuff. Jane Austen's books are very political. She talks mainly about, like, the class that she was in she was upper middle class but she her place in society wasn't steady hence uh why she often wrote about marriage because women's place was not exactly stable if her father died it wasn't guaranteed that she would have a place to stay and jane was lucky that she and her sister cassandra who both never married they were able to stay with their families once their father died but that was a real fear there is more political stuff that i could get into in her books like how the marriage of Mr. Knightley and Emma could be seen as him trying to take over her father's land. Even though Mr. Knightley is considered to be one of the better Jane Austen heroes, like, it makes you question, what are his motives? And even then, there's some characters that you don't know are very happy. And she also puts in a lot of sexual politics. Going back to Mansfield Park, she talks about adultery and what that would do to a person. Like, how that would literally change their life. It's very fascinating. I think that... Jane Austen, she had a very full life, and she did not need to be married to do so. As by and large, none of us do. Yeah. Many of us choose to, but it's not... We're well past the point where it's a necessary maturational milestone. Exactly. But I think historians and sort of people who critique classic literature... They sort of reduce her as to just being this person, and not as a person who loved to dance. She loved to put on plays despite what people think because of Mansfield Park, because there's a scene where it, it's a whole subplot, actually, where the uh, families put on a play. I don't really want to spoil it, but there is a lot of problems that come out of that. Play. Okay. But Jane liked to, have, to do plays. She enjoyed that kind of stuff. She wrote poetry. She she, enjo she basically, she enjoyed life. The reason why I put a uh, picture of a girl cheese sandwich in the collage is like, well, Jane Austen was a person. She also really liked food. She wrote about it quite a lot. See, I was wondering about that because one of the things I know about you, Victoria, is that you hate cucumber sandwiches, and I wasn't sure if that's what that was. Oh, it's a grilled cheese. There is a letter. I have it over there in the Dinner with, with Mr. Darcy cookbook by Penn Bogler. Very cool book, by the way. Uh, it basically takes scenes in the books of Jane Austen's novels or sort of things that come out of Jane's letters that kind of stuff, and she makes recipes based on primary sources. It's really, really cool. But there's one one letter where she's like, this guy gave me some toasted cheese, and it made me very, very happy. That's my summary of it. But she was very happy. I figured, like, the closest sort of thing to that would be grilled cheese, which is interesting. Anyways, I think that the reason why people tend to reduce her to those two relationships with Harris Bigwither and Thomas Lefroy is because they don't think that because she wasn't married means that she can't have an imagination. Jane Austen was clever and she was very, very observant. Her social commentary speak volumes, but I don't think that Jane needed to be in a sexual or romantic relationship to write as well as she did. She did not need to experience what her characters did to be a good writer. I think it does her a disservice to reduce her to just a spinster rather mm -hmm. than a person. And that's what I'm sort of saying is that we tend to treat historical figures by their marital status rather than as the things that they did or the lives they led. Only historical women. Only historical women. I think we could also talk about a bunch of other people as well. I suppose. I Definitely it's not a gender yeah. balance thing. A lot of your legal definition was... Well, who do you answer to? Your husband or your father? Exactly. Anyway. That was what I was getting at. I figured I used Jane Austen as an example. I know her pretty well. Like, I read about her quite a lot. She's a fascinating person. But I figured I'd use it to bring up the discussion that we tend to sort of put people into their marital status rather than the things that they do and the actions they take. Like, even now, people are asking questions. Well, when are you going to get married? When are you going to have kids? Because they think that's the only thing that is worthwhile. I agree. Yeah. I agree. So there I we go. I think it's still pressing. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that, Victoria. That was very interesting. I always love hearing from you. Thank you, Sloan. Like, I just like... from you, friend. I'm excited. I just love that you expose me to things that I don't seek out on my own. That's, that's you know... That's what our friendship is. Pretty well. I exposed you, and you exposed me to things that 
we never would have had uh, come across. If we just if I just ended that as I expose you, that would have been terrible. Oh, I have the power to edit that though. Yes, because no. oh my gosh, would uh, Dylan and Daniel not be happy about it? <laughs> Daniel would not be happy about it. <laughs> Anyways, I'm ready to hear this. All right. So, for my topic, I'm going to preface this by saying I know I'm not saying anything groundbreaking or controversial if I voice the critique that Valentine's feels pretty commercialized. Like, it feels like a fake Hallmark holiday. I'm going to explain to you why that's pretty much the case. (laughs) So, what I've decided to focus on is a couple of things. British postal reform and literacy rates in the Victorian period and how that has contributed to the modern Valentines. So I'll preface this by saying it's not invented out of thin air. Obviously, there were local traditions. I'm going to talk very briefly about that. But at the end of the 17th century... Actually, sorry, I'm going to change the order. I'm going to bring these things up. Sorry, I've got a lot of notes here, and I'm trying to figure out the most cohesive way to bring them up. Valentines through the mail become popularized really at the very, very end of the 18th century, and then into the 19th century, and you see them become part of the various holidays that really become codified in the Victorian era. A few decades in between those two dates, obviously. But in 1797, a British publisher issued a book called The Young Man's Valentine Writer, which contained scores of suggested sentimental verses that a young lover who was unable to compose his own might choose to send. They're awesome. I'm going to read some at the end of this. I cannot wait. This is facilitated by the fact that print is taking off, but specifically paper valentines are becoming popular in the decades that follow this due to the postal reforms of Sir Roland Hill. His big advent was he introduced, or he was one of the big campaigners for the Penny Black stamp, which was a reduced rate postal stamp. A academic by the name of David Vincent has done some reference writing on this. There's a book from Cambridge University Press called Literacy and Popular Culture in England that was one of the really interesting places I saw this mentioned a little bit. Link in the description if you're curious. It's on Google Scholar. But his reforms from kind of Vincent's writing in the chapter of this book that I looked at, his reforms had a huge impact on the accessibility of the post to the working class. However, that wasn't strictly viewed as a good thing among the other politicians and among the voting class. So after he introduced this, he actually had to kind of backtrack and reframe things a little bit to emphasize the middle class benefits and the benefits that it had to business owners in particular. So initially, the availability of a postal service and the project that kind of went with making it more affordable was partially rooted in working class literacy, which is obviously a huge thing that we deal with throughout the Industrial Revolution is the rise of education following industrialization, following people wanting essentially suffrage. Suffrage leads to literacy. That's a pretty direct thing that we've observed. I think we've even talked about this before in previous episodes. Yeah. But his project was initially viewed as not being successful. He had made a prediction for how many letters he expected to be sent with his penny black stamp, and that number was not observed. So rather than continuing to kind of use this as a campaign for literacy, he reframes it with regards to uh, the utility of the stamp, the utility of a postal service in general, making business flow smoother, which, once again, industrial revolution, that's a pretty important thing. However, interestingly enough, progressives continue to use this expansion of a postal service and the accessibility of a postal service as being important to literacy. And the way that gets framed is that literacy becomes viewed as vital to gainful employment, which allows some reformers to argue that widespread literacy will aid in solving unemployment and poverty. 
the Industrial Revolution we've talked about before as being a real moment where literacy starts to mean both reading and writing. For a lot of history, you had a far greater proportion of people who could read than people who could both read and write. Writing was that sort of extra thing. So that I find really interesting, and I wouldn't have never strictly thought of the Postal Service as being super important to that, but it makes sense when you start talking about mobility and when you start talking about practicing communication. In sociology, when we look at globalization from a sociological lens, we usually talk about technologies that compress time and space. So something like the railroad absolutely does that, is you no longer have people, by and large, dying within a couple of miles of where they were born. That was really interesting to me. I enjoyed uh, kind of finding that as I started off looking at mailing valentines. The other thing in the Industrial Revolution that really helps codify the use of paper valentines is the paper industry, is production, is factory labor. And Victoria, in a previous episode, I think the first episode we did this year, actually, I made a statement about how many Charles Dickens episodes I thought we should have a year. I'm going to implore upon you to not call me a hypocrite when I bring Dickens into the Victorian codification of Valentine's. And mostly because it was refreshing to me to hear about Dickens in a non-Christmas context. So in the book that David Vinson writes, he references a term coined by Charles Dickens of Cupid's Manufactory, which was referring to the vast number of women employed in the manufacturing industry for Valentine's. I don't have a year, but he says, I suppose, in the time of Dickens, when he termed it, there were over 3,000 women employed in manufacturing, specifically cards, love cards which is very cool. David Vincent writes that these letters carry to all tastes, all income levels, and most importantly, all literacy. Up until this time, handmade paper valentines were certainly being exchanged among the higher levels of society as part of courtship. But like many things in the Industrial Revolution, mass production brought what used to be for the elites to the masses. To such the point that, like, valentines become tacky. They haven't stopped being tacky. No, I mean, can I use the example of last week? I found the most beautiful collection of Star Wars Valentines for one dollar. They're like those children's Valentines. One thing I've noticed is that Valentines have gone down in quality over the years, like even more than before. Before they were made of a thicker paper, but now I found that they're made of a thinner paper, and they just did not try with these cards. Um, for example, I'm your astromath friend. <laughs> Does that make sense? Dude, I ha- I'm not a Star Wars person. I don't know. Like, uh, if- an astromech is is a droid, okay. so like R two D two, but they don't really refer to them as that in the movies that often. So like, unless you're like a really niche kid, they're not gonna get it. Or the First Order. My Valentine. Does that seem like a Valentine's Day thing to you? Yeah, I mean, Astrobeck just sounds kind of inappropriate, which is my first uh, response to that. Like, I don't know what the orders are. So, First Order is like a recreation of the Empire from the Star Wars films, the initial Star Wars films. Darth Vader's grandson is the uh, one of the leaders of that. We're not going to get into my thoughts on the fact that Kylo Ren and is stupid. <laughs> He's a very good actor. Adam Driver's great. I feel like they could have done more with him and made him more of a well-rounded character other than um, that he's evil and he's a fanboy for his granddad. My, uh, my first thought whenever Adam Driver comes up is I am one of the people who sat through the entire three hours that was Martin Scorsese's Silence. Which really looked like it was going to be a historical drama, and really looked like it was going to be heavy history. It wasn't. It, it was a weird... I don't know what to, how to describe it. Um, it was disappointing. Silence is weird. And yeah. Yeah. I saw it in theaters. I do just have yeah. a little bit more that I found that I thought was interesting about Dickens' connection to Valentine's. He is a pretty big part of popularizing the idea of Valentine's cards. He writes a book. It's one of his serial novels, so it gets called by two different names, but 
Uh, it's usually either referred to as the Pickwick Papers or the Pickwick Club, but he definitely solidifies the idea of a valentine as like a noun that refers to a card. It's on Cliff Notes. They would do a better job of explaining it than I would because Cliff Notes presumably read it. I didn't. Sorry. That, that's fine. Dude, um, like we had like only a couple of days to set this up, so... Yeah, but yeah, so he's got that. The other thing that David Vincent, who I did obviously read a fair bit of to do this episode, talks about is that, as I mentioned before, because they become a little bit tacky, they're mostly out of fashion by 1914. And David Vincent doesn't say anything on why specifically... 1914 is they're out of fashion. I do wonder if he wasn't... Uh, so there's two possibilities. Either World War One had something to do with them falling out of fashion. Perhaps it was a mm -hmm. limited resource sort of thing. We know that a lot of things went out of fashion during the war because resources yeah. had to go towards the war. I also don't know if David Vincent just is using that as a demarcation of, like, periodization. I don't know for him if for him the start of World War I is a significant enough event that he feels like that's where he's cutting off his period. I don't think that that... I don't know what year the Victorian era ends. I think Queen Victoria is dead by this point. Uh, 1901. Yeah, so that's very interesting to me. He remarks the tackiness of them, or kind of the tawdriness that they've become, and they've become kind of cheap. It might be the reason why they fall out of fashion, but it might also be a symptom of the fact that, like, they're not fashionable, so the effort isn't being put into them. And then he remarks that as the Valentine's card is sort of losing its cultural iconography for the Victorians, it's replaced with what he describes as, quote, the more generalized and eventually more prolific expression of sentiment, the Christmas card. I found that all to be very interesting. I did actually manage to track down a scanning of the young man's Valentine writer from uh, 1797, which is a collection of poems, if you are not a poet, but you want to trick someone into thinking you're a poet, because we know that... Uh, Every gal likes a yes. poet. So, uh, kind of like a fuckboy's uh, guide to <laughs> guide to wooing a lady. Possibly, honestly, the couple that I want to read. So, a lot of these are like a poem and then a response, and it almost to me reads more like a joke book or like that type of novelty. For example, so this is a poem that uh, presumably you could write into a letter that you're going to give to somebody or your calling card. Yeah. Like them you are, for sweet and fine, I've chose you to be my valentine. And then the response to that is, Thomas, the truth I must tell, I like your person very well, for often from the choicest tree, nice cuddles you have brought me. So your fruit I will incline, and own you for my valentine. You know, it's dirty. It's dirty. It's cutesy, but also it's kind of dirty. It's yeah, really it's, dirty. I was like thinking, it's dirty. Like, Whoa, um, this is saucy. There, like a bunch of these are like the response is rejecting. Oh, good. I think I found one of them. Yes. Okay. So this is Will the Coachman to Jenny the Cook. This is uh, if you're familiar with like the way the Victorians like to tell jokes, they quite often had like a give and a response, and the response is usually the punchline, or if you like Tom Swifties, that sort of thing. But Will the Coachman writes to Jenny the Cook. Jenny, whenever you roast or boil, you make my heart within me broil. Or when you're at home making arts or making pudding pies or tarts. I lick my lips with such good cheer, and call you then my life and dear. When those garments with grease your garnets shine, you must be my valentine. And uh, Jenny the cook writes back, Go mind your horses in the stable. You never shall sit with me at the table. For your own words do plainly prove you are nothing more than covered love. I don't know what covered love is, but damn, Jenny. Well, part of me thinks it's just like, you know... <laughs> Quickie in the cupboard. <laughs> Good old cupboard love. <laughs> I think it's interesting, like, seeing how, like, cards have such an integral role into the commercialization of certain holidays, because we even see that with Christmas. Uh, you and I attended an event where Dr. Martin talked about how the Victorian Christmas card really helped to create the yeah. industry of Christmas as it is today. I have a bunch of these put off like in notes and there's one that I just wrote fucking legends next to so I do need to find that one at very least for you guys. Oh well, yes so this one maybe 
Yeah. So this one is simply addressed to an old maid. Your deep sunk eyes, your withered face, your rotted teeth, which seem to chafe each other, your lawnhorn jaws, your hands like lobster claws, your graceful gait, your slender shape, put me in mind of Pug the Ape when dressed in ke- petticoats so fine, yet you are for sure my valentine. Love that. If there's a, I forget the, the sonnet number. Shakespeare did a sonnet where he basically insults the woman the entire time, yeah. but he says, but I love her despite all that. Yeah. There is a response that comes from the old maid. <laughs> Thou monkey, dressed up like a bow, I'm not for you, I'll have you know. So lean, so lank, you flip away. It's probably slip away. So lean, so lank, you slip away. You are the make game all the day. Your own sweet person you admire, but can't yet fulfill love's fond desire. My indignations you may see, I am no valentine for thee. Okay. There's a lot of these. I was able to access it pretty easily. I think I found it on Google Scholar. I'll put a link in the description if you want to read some more. I'm probably going to cut out a couple of the ones I read just because they're long and hard to read because F's are S's. But S's are also S's. Yeah, it's, it's weird. I love it though. Even though it's confusing, it's sort of fun Like when you're listening to podcasts and they're reading stuff like this and they put start pronouncing all the Fs and you go, it, it's just funny. It's just really funny. I, I don't find it funny. I find it annoying and I'm not going to put our listeners through that. No, that's fair. I just, when I'm listening to another podcast, yeah. they'll do that. I don't like when they do that. I, I know. And that's fair. There, there's no point in editing audio if you're going to leave mistakes. I in. think that if you don't really know about something, sometimes it's interesting having that input, hearing about it eventually. Ah. All right. I believe we have some Q&As now. We have lots. Do we want to do our announcement or do we want to do a Q&A first? Let's do the Q&A first and then we'll do the announcement. All right, so the first one is from Spire Podcast. So how did the podcast come about? Vic doesn't take no for an answer. True. <laughs> so from the beginning of our friendship, I was like, this. I really like talking to Sloan. I have fun talking to Sloan. And about three months in, I said, we should start a podcast. And and I said, nah, yeah, bleh. <laughs> I think more specifically you said no. I said no, um, and then you asked me again, like, another three months, and I still said no, and then you waited until we were halfway through coat, and then I said By then yes. we came up with a fun topic, and, uh, we yeah. know each other well enough at this point, like, we trust each other, we... Yeah. We should also say that part of the reason we did this was we used to be able to be very active and involved on our university campus doing history-related programming. Obviously, that's not particularly possible during COVID for in-person events. And we didn't feel like the old medium was going to transfer well. We had one or two things that we tried to do, like a group Zoom, or we tried to do those style, and we didn't really get a lot of response. Yeah. But the Interdisciplinary History Podcast has been so much fun, and we've had such a great response. Like, we're really grateful for that. All right, next question. From Chaotic Neutral Podcast, what's your favorite color? For me, it's probably, at the moment, teal. Although, I also like Robin's Egg Blue. I guess I like to say I like a blue color palette. Yeah. Probably gray. I like gray. It's an understated color. Underappreciated. From Marissa from Death and Decay Podcast, what are your personal long-term goals? Uh, why don't you go first on that? I don't know if it's, like, with the podcast, um... Yeah. Well, it's, like, personal, like, that's what's throwing me. Um... Uh, for the podcast, I'd like to do this uh, for as long as we can, as until we feel like it's run its course. I feel like that would be good. Personally, I would like to write a book, whether it be fiction or non-fiction. That's something I would like to do. My minor is in English. I'm very interested in the way literature and history combine with one another. You sort of saw that today, but that's just sort of the thing that fascinates me a lot. And anyways, what about you, Sloan? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm happy to keep doing the podcast as long as it can. I'm satisfied that we keep making episodes. I don't have any huge lofty goals there. Personal goals? I like I don't think of my personal goals as my academic goals. Like I I consider myself to be grad school bound, which might be hubris. I mean, same here. <laughs> um, home ownership. Home home ownership is a big old lifetime long term goal for me. Very cool. All right. From XX Podcast on Instagram, if you would visit any historic site in the world, where would your number one place be? That's hard. Yeah, I think the 
thing with historic sites is they tend to be very tied to big events, and that's not really what I go out for. Like, I'm interested more in trends and things over time. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe Rotterdam. When I went to Japan, not last summer, but the summer before, it was either going to be Japan or Rotterdam. So I would say I'd like to see some of that That city. would be really cool. I think, like you said, it's sort of hard to pick a historic site. I kind of like to do tours of places rather than just do one, like, go to one place and study that one place. I feel like if you want to just uh, study a whole place and, it, and, like, its connection to history or study a historic moment, you have to go to multiple different places and explore one place, I think... I, it's not a historic site, but I want to go back to Prague again, just because it's such a historic city, and I was only there for about two days, and there was so much I wanted to look at that I didn't get to. I had a friend who wasn't as into, like, death history as I am, so I didn't get to go and uh, have a look at, like, the Jewish cemetery, or I really wanted to go and look in some of the museums they have there. So, not a historic site, but a historic place i'd probably want to go see Prague. i currently have been very interested in scottish history so i'd like to take a tour of scotland one day okay from starting overdrive how is this podcast an authentic extension of you of who you are as people okay so sloan is uh, gesturing to me hmm. well i think we're both very interested in telling stories from many different perspectives but also trying to tell them in a way that connects with people I think one of the things with our previous work is that we were telling stories that weren't connecting to people. Like, they they were just difficult to sort of, mm -hmm. for people to identify with. But, like, with our podcast, we're telling stories, and, like, we've heard feedback on this, and how much the content we do connects with people, and how they don't think about these angles that we're taking with our interdisciplinary approach to history. I think that that's kind of, like, what we like since the beginning of our friendship that's been what we're sort of interested yeah. in is telling stories um, in a different way i mean like bold of you to assume that like i'm not just a character uh bold of you to assume that i exist outside this podcast um <laughs> yeah i guess my serious response to that is i would never say something and outside my values i would never leave something in the show that was outside my values that being said, like, in terms of an authentic self, I... This podcast is not about me. This podcast is not about us as your hosts. So it's hard for me to be, like, authentic. Like, I don't really know how to... I don't really know what that is. I would say that I am invested in this podcast. Like, I definitely... It's something that I put my labor into. It's something that is a creative process for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know if I've answered that. Okay. Anyways, let's go on to our next question. It's a really hard question. Thanks, starting overdrive. From Calamity and Coffee, what is your favorite history topic to study? Uh, how broad can a topic be? I think it can be very broad, because I'm thinking of a couple of different things. Yeah, I, I appreciate that the question is asking topic and not period. And I think that's probably indicative of somebody who's listening to our show and knows that, you know, this is not a pay place where we put a lot of stock in periodization. I am really interested in legal social history. So that would be things like things that get codified as laws because we assume that they are harmful, and what does it say to assume that they're harmful? Uh, so that can be anything from the emergence of substance laws to, yeah, just kind of the way that we define deviance and harmfulness uh, in society. I think that's a great answer. So, ah, uh, I'm kind of all over the place. I'm fascinated by the history of crime. I'm also interested in uh, the history of espionage. Like my reading in general, I'm kind of all over the place with the historical topics I'm fascinated by. I've always been fascinated by the history of food, the way it connects to uh, society and social class, and specifically also the way, like, documentation. Like, what foods have been deemed worthy of documentation, and why is that? Mm -hmm. and especially because if you've read a historical cookbook, they're a pain in the ass. I wrote about that on our blog when I did our Victorian Christmas pudding. They're not easy. And especially from a modern point of view, we're used to like cups and 
tablespoons, like that being a set measurement, even though those aren't really accurate and they can fluctuate depending on the temperature, which is why I personally prefer a scale, but that's just me. But it's interesting reading about how food history connects with our own history as a society. I've got so many historical food cookbooks. I'm poor partner's gonna have to deal with about that we're gonna have a ginormous cookbook collection and it's gonna be either literature inspired tv show inspired or based on history i think mm. i only have two normal cook so this is an argument that i heard made uh in something recently the argument was that you should consider tv shows and movies literature because anything that you read is literature and the actors are reading the script to interesting. you that's interesting that, that is fascinating Anyways, uh, <laughs> sorry, only two or yeah. three quick books in our world. I'm just fascinated by that as well. I think there's so many topics. Like Sloan said, I'm very interested in the Regency period, but mainly around Jane Austen. Frankly, I'm not interested in the King Regent other than the fact that he's honestly kind of weird, like very weird dude. Uh, Not going to get into that. I'm very interested in literary history and that kind of stuff. The next question. Interesting history nonfiction. Okay, I'm gonna give three. The Faithful Executioner by Joel F. Harrington. Very good, very accessible, interesting, late 16th century, looking uh, not just at the death penalty, but specifically at the idea of you need to have someone in society whose role is to perform the death penalty. Obviously, that in and of itself is something that can be very othering. This looks at the process for how that role gets legitimized. Very, very cool read. Uh, I remember reading it quickly. It's probably been a couple of years. The second recommendation I'm going to make is Andrew Pedigree's Invention of the News, which is published through Yale University Press. It's Good. It was one of those nonfiction books that I picked up for a course, but essentially it looks at the expansion of the Postal Service and the expansion of news networks. And one of the arguments he makes is that the Postal Service was vital to the Holy Roman Empire being the Holy Roman Empire. So it's a really good if you're interested in communication history, I recommend that. Related to communication history, I would recommend Robert Darton's Censors at Work. It's a three-part book where he examines the role that states play in legitimizing knowledge through publication and through censorship. The thing that I found incredibly interesting about this book that I hadn't considered before is the fact that when you look at the expansion of the printing press, particularly in Bourbon, France, the peer review process and the censor process are the same process, which is very, very interesting when you get concerned about powers of knowledge and who gets to legitimate knowledge. It talks about scandal. It's really, really good. That's the first part of the book. The second part of the book deals with British India and imperialism. And the third part of the book looks at Communist East Germany and its censors. Really interesting cross-examination. I wouldn't say that he's comprehensive, but he is interesting. It was a good read. Really good. So for interesting nonfiction, I have two memoirs. One being Defying Hitler by Sebastian Hafner. Sebastian Hafner's examination of Weimar era Germany and um, sort of how he experienced that through his childhood and then the rise of Hitler. And basically, it's an unfinished memoir that his son found after he passed. Sebastian Hafner was a famous writer, but that was the one thing that he just couldn't finish because it was very difficult. You were in his life. I read it for a course at McEwen, and it was one of those books that I read that just stuck with me afterwards. Yeah, with Dr. Krebsky. That was the book. I read for her course. It was next nice. one is A Testament of Youth by Vera Britton. It's a pretty hefty book, I have to say. Like I read this when I was a teenager. It's like 600 pages, and it's about Vera Britton talks about World War One from the perspective of a woman who initially stayed at home and then went to war, also trying to get an education. And she also had an interest in women's suffrage. It's just fascinating, just looking from like a modern lens upon that, because that's basically just her her story. And yeah. It was turned into a movie recently with Alicia Vikander and Kit Harrington. So very nice if you want to watch a movie that 
will make you cry. Check that out. And the next one is Van Gogh's Ear, The True Story by Bernadette Murphy. I picked this up mainly because I love Vincent Van Gogh's art and this examines what happened the night Vincent cut off his ear. And she specifically goes into a lot of detail I remember about where on the ear he cut off. And that was just fascinating to me because people just seem to think that it's the entire ear. And she's like, no, it was the lower part of the ear, like the earlobe and stuff. I thought it was very fascinating, especially considering the records she went through. I would recommend another nonfiction book, but we are talking about it on a future episode, and I don't want to spoil that. Yeah, we are. You guys don't get to read ahead. No, you can read afterwards. All right, back into the questions. Yeah, maybe just a couple more. We kind of answered two of these questions. Good. Favorite moment during the podcast? Uh, I don't know. They're all pretty good. They're all pretty good. I'm the editor, so if I don't like it, you guys don't get to hear it. <laughs> it's basically think, how it goes. I think when we hit 150 listens, that was probably my favorite moment. It's like that people are wanting to listen to us and they're listening to us more and more. And also, I also really had a lot of fun recording our first episode. So yeah. What historical figure or incident would you like to cover from a concert that made us podcast? Oh, and the uh, previous question came from Excel Podcast. I've answered this before. I'd uh, like to look at the 1969 Democratic Convention and the political uproar that surrounded that. We're probably going to do that via a film review at some point in the future. I said I have an interest in espionage, but specifically women's role in espionage and code breaking. I would like to cover something like that. I read a lot about women in espionage. And the last one is from Your Slice of Life. How did you become friends? Uh, weird attracts weird. Yeah. We were sitting in, in a Wait. common room, really. Uh, like, we met before, but we weren't, didn't, like, connect, really. Yeah, we were introduced through, like, another school peer, and yeah, we ended up, like, the way anyone becomes friends, we talked to each other, we weren't annoyed by each other, we continued to talk to each other. We connected over the fact that I wanted uh, to do something with the history of Dracula. Oh, and... yeah, we actually, that's that's true, we both, we found out that we were both huge fans of uh, the one novel that Bram yeah. Stoker is known for. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. That is exactly uh, and, what happened. Uh, we also <laughs> talked about, like, just having an interesting gothic fiction. We realized that we both really love Halloween and would like it to always be Halloween. We are just very spooky people. Okay. All right, so we're getting to the last part of the podcast. Do we want to make the announcement? Yeah, I feel like we've built it up. Like, it's not exciting for you guys. I forgot. I, just, I love it. All right, well, go for so it. So we got a Patreon account, guys. I'm probably going to link it below, but we started this up a couple of weeks ago, and it's really fun. We've got a couple of cool tiers. We hope everybody keeps listening for free, but yeah. if you feel like buying us a cup of, cup of coffee, cup of tea, neither of us drink coffee, that's one of the levels, we would appreciate it. Either way, we're doing this out of enjoyment. Yeah. Yeah, anyways. Before we sign off, Sloan and I would like to acknowledge that McEwen University, this podcast, and all the content we create are located and produced on Treaty 6 territory. This land has traditionally and continues to be a home, place of gathering, and meeting ground for many Indigenous peoples. This includes the Nakota Sioux, Nitsidipi, Métis, Salto, and Cree First Nations. You can find all our podcasts all on your favorite podcast directories on, and on YouTube. We added some more recently, so have check that out. You'll find all of our social media in the description box. And uh, yeah, if you'd like to be a guest or to have a suggestion for a future episode or a blog post topic, please let us know by shooting an email. I'll leave that in the description box as well. You can also reach out to us on social media. I'm always there. If you have a question or if you would like to talk to us, just shoot us a message. We're, we're friendly people. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this. Stay tuned for our next recording. Yeah, have a great day, everyone. Bye! Thank <laughs> you.